Dr. Jagdish Sheth is the Charles H. Kelstad Professor of Business at the Goizuera Business School at Emory University in Atlanta. He is globally known for his scholarly contributions in consumer behavior, relationship marketing, competitive strategy, and geopolitical analysis, and has over 50 years of combined experience in teaching and research at the University of Southern California, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Columbia University, MIT, and Emory University. Dr. Shait is a recipient of the 2020 Padma Bhushan Award and has served on many boards around the world, including that of Wipro Limited. He has also authored and co-authored dozens of books and hundreds of papers, including the famous Howard Shait Theory of Biobehavior and his latest book, India's Road to Transformation. Hi, Professor Shait. Welcome to the Sensei Kojaku Show. Thank you so much for coming on. You are more than welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Why do you think Indians have been so incredibly successful um, disproportionately successful, in fact, in the U.S. I, and, and let me use you as an example. Um, you went to the U.S. with essentially one asset, which was yourself, right? It was your own intelligence and desire to make something of yourself. So could you explain to me why people like yourself have been so incredibly disproportionately successful in America? First major reason is that people like us came with a very, very strong educational background. But still, education matters in terms of rising at the more, you know, higher visible levels, like professors, scientists, doctors, even legislative politicians nowadays in many countries. So the investment was made by India. In my own case, for example, I got education free. I paid very little. Education was more inclusive in India than in America at the time. That's clearly one factor. Second factor is values. We were all brought up with strong values about family values. It's still your obligation to take care of your parents, invest in your children in the future. Those family values make you model citizens. And the other reason is exactly that more opportunities are available in Western economies, especially in America after World War II. We have been given enormous opportunity, especially in the U.S., some in Canada, some in England. And those opportunities we were able to take advantage of in a positive way primarily. I think that's very important also. The Indian diaspora has been more integrated. In other words, we don't have places where the only Indians live. As I think we are dispersed into the mainstream America, for example. We live in neighborhoods where our Neighbors may not be all Indians, for example, or what used to be called ghetto. Those are poor ghettos or rich ghettos, doesn't make any difference. We have the rich ghettos, which are the gated community, billionaires living together. To me, that's a ghetto also. Actually, <laughs> different ghetto, but it's right? So uh, you work with your neighbors who are basically non-Indian. Their children are friends with your children. So you are cosmopolite very well. The last thing, and very interesting one, I think, is that I think it's something we don't talk about it too much. It's not as conscious, but it is there. Yeah. Namely, that we grow up in a society which itself is very diverse. Think about South Indians settling in Matunga in Bombay. After the independence, labor mobility within the country began to rise. So not all Gujaratis live in Gujarat. Not all Punjabis live in Punjab. Not all Tamil Nadu live in Tamil Nadu. And you see that therefore you live in different cultures and basically living in different countries in some fashion. And you get used to that. So you are basically cosmopolite or multiculturally conscious individual. And you learn how to adapt. If you look at the career paths of CEOs of Indian origin leading large technology companies, uh, like the Google and the Microsoft of the world. But more importantly, any multinational enterprise, well-trained in India, but they are placed in stranger countries, like as soon as you graduate and you work for Unilever, you are put into Thailand, you put into Indonesia, a Gulf country where you don't know the language, <laughs> you don't know the culture, you have to survive. So in your early stages, you become truly multinational, very similar to diplomatics. What, to your mind, do you think 
are the most exciting aspects of India today, um, primarily economically? And why do you think India is poised to have what many are calling a golden decade or even a golden century economically? I think three ingredients are very key to understand talent at a scale and a size that very few other countries can duplicate. Just the sheer numbers. Well educated, predominantly English speaking, so they can be universal resource, not just the Indian resource. So that's really one talent is clearly one factor. And second one is technology. I think India is leapfrogging technology to a level that nobody had imagined. I worked on the commercialization of the cellular telephone for Bell Labs and AT&T. And in 1983, when we looked into the world of cellular telephone, the biggest forecast made by outside consultants was that there'll be only about 958,000 subscribers by year 2000. They were off by a few billion. <laughs> Nobody imagined China will become a dominant use of cellular technology, or India will become the second largest, now maybe the largest, et cetera. I think leapfrogging technology has been a very key asset in India. And within technology, the most exciting part is that quite often to create a single standard, it may require a government enterprise to create a standard. A public sector in India is a very valuable asset. For example, Azar would not have happened through private economy because people would have fought for different architectures, etc. UPI, a very recent one, is mind-boggling how much capability is given in the hands of everybody, whether you are rural or urban, literate or illiterate. I think it's very interesting to watch. And UPI may aspire to become more and more an international acceptance mechanism for exchange of goods and services as Singapore is accepting it now, as France is accepting, especially for Indian tourists to go out or buy merchandise or traders, whatever turns out to be. I'm watching UPI with more interest in the process and other with more interest in the process. Mm -hmm. I think next breakthroughs may come because you are in a brand new slate. You don't have the legacy system to hold you back. The third ingredient is very unique to India, although it is everywhere, which is entrepreneurship. The real competitive advantage of a nation is not resources as much as entrepreneurship. If you go back to the modern economics, Adam Smith, in addition to land, labor, and capital, he added a fourth factor called entrepreneurship. He was very smart about that. And entrepreneurship is universal. It does not recognize gender. Women are as entrepreneurs or better, I think, more than men does not recognize age. You can be an entrepreneur at a younger age or an older age. Does not recognize faith. Every faith have entrepreneurs. It's interesting. Yeah. To me, that entrepreneurship is a very powerful resource or an asset that India has. And we have shown that thing. Given the opportunity with the Startup India things, I sit on the board of a venture capital advisory committee member, for example. And we are amazed about the kinds of things that they are doing it. And of course, we are producing more unicorns, you know, more and more billionaires out of India. But it was, it was something that was not nurtured, that was not encouraged, that was not appreciated. And you don't have to be just in technology to be an entrepreneur. You can have entrepreneurship in infrastructure, like Adani family has done very well, for example. So, you know, entrepreneurship is universal everywhere. Fourth element is more recent, which is a change in the people's mindset in India where there's a tremendous amount of positive self-image. Not just nationalism by saying how much should I love my country and all, 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 all countries that are transformed at a very strong nationalism forward behind. America and Abraham Lincoln or after that, I can give you all the examples. But I think it's more saying that I can do things. I'm not helpless. I'm not tied down by government policies, procedures. So can-do attitude is enormous. It's very contagious. 
If one individual feels I can do, his or her friend feel I can do it also, etc. It's very contagion theory essentially. So to me, positive self-image is a very key factor that has transformed India at a level that was not imagined. There's only one thing that can hold back India like any, any other nation. It happened in America. People don't look at the history. It is neither the technology nor the capital that slows down a nation, but it is the environment. In the early days of industrialization in America, most polluted cities were Pittsburgh and Los Angeles. Think about that. Most polluted cities in Europe were all on the riverbeds where people exploited the natural resources. Factories were put in there. But they cleaned it up. It basically taught, thought that humans are the most important species. We have the God-given right to take advantage of other species, animal, vegetation, whatever they are. And I think now we are understanding that the ecosystem is so interdependent. It is in our self-interest to protect the bugs, insects. It is in our interest to protect whether those are sea marine lives, whatever it is. Our own existential threat is actually for us not protecting other species. We are learning more and more now about how to have a coexistence between diff different species of biodiversity in many ways. So I think all of these things makes you more optimistic that despite the rise of emerging economies like China, India, and Africa is a major way. I have a whole video presentation on rise of Africa, mind-boggling. Second half of this century, we'll talk about with Africa with the same surprise, shock, and awe as we thought about China. Nobody thought that China 30 years ago will rise, but India now, same thing is going to happen with Africa. So given all that, to me, environment is a very key, key challenge that one has to manage on a preemptive basis. That is such an important point, right? That you have to find balance and you cannot you cannot sacrifice the future for the now. I think that's that's really what you're driving at and you have to think of the long-term implications of any decisions you take today. Um, but Professor, I want to talk about this entrepreneurship point um, that you spoke about and the tremendous value having the right entrepreneurs has for a country and an economy. And I want to use one particular entrepreneur as an example, someone who you obviously know very well as a result of having sat on that company's board for many years. I'm talking about Wipro Limited, which of course is one of India's most iconic companies of all time. Um, and of course, I want to talk about Mr. Azim Premji, who you of course know very well. And I want to use my own little example of when I saw him. And I want you to really talk about why it is so essential that entrepreneurs, when they achieve success, they follow his path of not only building great businesses and creating economic prosperity, but are also excellent citizens and use the wealth they amass over time to help society at large. And I'll, I'll, I'd like to just share my own little experience with him. I mean, I can't even call it with him and he just happened to be there. So I was many years ago, I was at an airport and we were in the check-in line waiting and he, you know, there was this very tall gentleman, you know, a few, few spots ahead of us. And my dad asked me, I was like quite, I must have been like maybe 10, 12 year old, years old at this point. And he's like, you know who that is? He whispers to me and I was like, he, he looks familiar. I feel like I've seen his picture somewhere, but I can't, I can't quite place him. So then he, you know, he said, this is happened to me, Mr. Azim Premji. And he runs this very large company called Wipro and, you know, done these incredible things and so on. And the reason that stuck with me is you had this man who, I mean, he could have bought the airline if he wanted to, you know, I mean, it's someone who's that successful in life. And he was quietly without any, you know, noise or anything, anyone around him quietly waiting in line like the rest of us mortals, sort of going through his spaces and quietly got on the flight, sat through the whole flight, reached his destination, everything. And if you didn't happen to know him, there would be no indication that this was this incredibly successful man. So again, my, my, my question really is that how important is it that for an economy from a long term perspective, we have such entrepreneurs who think of not just themselves, but society at large? Well, I think it's very important. It's very important for 
self happiness or self well being i have met many many entrepreneurs or chairman of large corporations as coach advisor and i learned over time that if you make money without meaning it's meaningless if you make money and do not contribute back to the society society isolates you you are a taker not a giver there is actually no self interest to be other interest contradiction almost right and i've seen that many of the new technology entrepreneurs without having an anchor or giving back while they are still active not after retirement is very key and azim has that trait clearly azim premji is a dear friend i admire him for that the other key skill set he has is that he knows how to identify talent mm-hmm. you don't identify talent by being in your office you have to go around meet people etc whether those talents are wherever they are he has a absolutely incredible knack of identifying what our rough diamond he is a very good diamond cutter and he gets the brilliance out of the person so ultimately his mission seems to be across what i have seen is to make ordinary people extraordinary which is why people who work at wipro especially his close colleagues are so loyal to the company and loyal to him it's very much a style of leadership more like a coach in a athletic setting coach is not in the limelight as much as the players the coach trains them sees how the student can improve the athlete can improve and get more potential out he has a knack of doing that i watched him since i started working with him in 1985 in bombay when the office was in bombay nariman point some place we would go together just a wonderful time uh so to me there are certain traits i have often called him mcdonald's french fries he reminds me of french fries <laughs> people say what does that mean crispy on the outside but soft on the inside <laughs> he's very soft human being i mean he put a facade of being tough in some fashion you know but he's very soft he he has a sense of empathy not only is passionate enthusiasm three characteristics of a good leader are enthusiasm passion compassion or empathy and a third one of course is competence he is very competent even though he may not be a technology person he reads up so much and i've seen him with numbers better than anybody else and he remembers all the numbers when i sat on the board he was more understanding all the numbers than anybody else in the board meeting is an act of figuring out properly so to me that's very very important so i do agree that he is one of the entrepreneurs that is risen to the occasion and his generosity of giving so much back to the society which he will tell you was influenced by warren buffett and bill gates who started the trend about give back half of your money the society but the level of generosity that he has done is incredible it will be very very hard to match also identifying a particular area like uh, teacher education and have a uh, azim prem university focused on education is very fundamental ultimately i always say that if you take a grain of wheat and make it into a loaf of bread agricultural commodity the value added is only three times maybe four times cost of wheat is about 1/3 1/4 of the loaf if you take a rough diamond and polish it a good diamond cutter will increase the value from a rough diamond to a marketable diamond about 15 to 20 times now there are exceptions 100 times but more generally average will be that but if you take a human being mentor polish educate value added is infinite 
And he has produced enormous talent. People don't realize we provide such, such a talented people, most of it because of his own mentorship style. Now, of course, it's a large corporation. He cannot do it alone. But I think cultivating that whole notion in management team to say, your job is to realize the potential of other employees in the company, pretty much. So to me, uh, it's a great example you've taken. Uh, he's, he's an icon, he's a living legend, uh, very similar to what we think about Ratan Tata, the same way we think about in India. These are two very interesting personalities who have contributed back to the society and they're very humble at the same time. That's a very important point, right? That the leader of any organization has to be a role model for everyone within that organization. Because ultimately, people are going to be more influenced by what they see rather than, you know, what you may say in a public forum. So I, I think it's important that your actions match your words, which I think in his case is clearly the case. Um, and so talking about, talking about inspirational and effective leaders, I want to now talk about the importance of when either a company, an organization, or even a country is trying to take that step up and become a leader in its space or you know, grow to its full potential. The importance of having the right person in charge. Can you explain to me what you see as both as A, the characteristics of truly effective leaders? I know you spoke about this a bit in your previous answer, but if you were to talk about it more in a, at a country level, um, what, what do you think are the most effective qualities of leaders and why it is important that when a country decides to take that step, why it is important that the right person is in charge at that point and he or she is given sufficient time. In your book, for instance, you talk about 15 years as being an important duration um, for a leader to be in charge. So could, could you talk about those points and, and and how a leader can be more effective as, as a political leader? A political leader has to be pragmatic. Mm -hmm. All the historical research that we have done from Mustafa Kemal in Turkey, from a clannish faith-based to a more secular state, more modern state, or Park Chung-hee in South Korea, a military person becoming the leader of a military coup, but suddenly realizing that a feudal society is not the future, but making and transitioning, repositioning the nation into the most modern society. Or oh, Deng Xiaoping, of course, in China. So small countries, large countries, very pragmatic leader to transition the economy from a communism-based ideology to a market economy. And he had a very famous saying, you know, it does not matter whether the color of the cat is a black or white, so long as it catches mice. Very, very practical, you know, I mean, you can, you can relate to that immediately, what he means. I think pragmatism is a very key skill set. All of these have it. Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. Abraham Lincoln, surprisingly, was very pragmatic. So was federal, I mean, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, as we call him, during the uh, Great Depression and then the World War II coming in. Ma, if you look at uh, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, who transformed from a highly regulated bureaucratic economy to deregulation, massive deregulation of the Heathrow Airport, for example, the under, underground tube, for example, energy business, everything, British Airways, British Telecom. I mean, that's key shift. Again, the key point again is that these people actually are very pragmatic. Second skill set I've observed among all the leaders worldwide and especially political leaders, is that they know how to execute. Giving promises is easy. All elections, any place in the world, you see candidates giving promises about what they will do if you're elected, but getting it done afterwards. And that's very key. So execution, again, the best country I found in execution was Singapore. It was done. Got the consensus going among all of the leaders, Either those are bureaucratic leaders, or permanent secretaries, or the brain power, or the political uh, leaders, essentially. Even though you have a single party, there's a the give and take and getting it done. I mean, I've seen myself, my advice in Singapore being manifested physically in five years, 10 years. Very interesting. 
So that's it. So to me, execution is a key skill set. The third one you know, is hands-on, practical. Pragmatic, practical. The third one is that they should be able to communicate. All of the transformative leaders were great communicators. Really great. They knew how to touch the masses. And they're very comfortable with masses. Leaders who come to highly elitist class are uncomfortable with the masses. They never grew up in the masses. The masses. If you look at world leaders again, most of them were really ordinary people who rose through the occasion for whatever reason and became political leaders. So humble beginnings often touching the masses, communication skills at not only the elite level, but at the mass level is very key, pretty much. And how do you create a positive outlook about the future? You have to have some sort of a mission that is optimistic. Future is better, brighter, if you know how to unlock it pretty much. And I think that's, that, that comes out loud and clear among all of the leaders we've seen pretty much. Those are really important points, actually. And, and the one that sticks out for me is being practical and pragmatic and understanding that often you have to deal with gray areas, you have to deal with trade-offs. And I think unless someone is very pragmatic, they're not going to be able to do that. India's growing presence at a global scale, at a global level, and India's attempt to become a key player both economically and politically around the world. So could you explain why you think it is important that India try and achieve that role in a global setting? The first main reason is that Indian economy itself is transitioning from being a domestic oriented, restricted economy under the license Raj to more and more a market economy. It is globalizing in other words. And if you are globalizing as an economy and politically, then you have to participate in global events, global you know, activities like G20 leadership, for example, in 2023, or whatever turns out to be the case. They are that so clearly as India becomes globally integrated and aspires to go from a low income to a high income country or an economy, one of the key factors is what I would call economies of scale. The second factor is that we need to counterbalance, India wants to counterbalance the enormous influence China has in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, surprisingly, to counterbalance that with India's soft power. Soft power is India's culture, but most importantly, Indian diaspora. Indian diaspora is very strategic for India's global aspirations, and therefore one has to understand how do we leverage that positively for India's future itself, but more importantly for the world economy in general? That's a very clearly a second factor, I think, that's come about. And at the same time, the third major reason is more political. And the political dimension is that the agencies created after World War II through Bretton Woods Conference in New Hampshire, United Nations, International Monetary Fund, and World Bank are all legacy agencies. You really need to work with them and transform them. The only way you can transform them is to have a global participation, global activism in some fashion, especially at the United Nations. Those rules were written or created at a time when the dominant allies, basically America and, and, and England, for example, and the allies created standards in their own favor, essentially. The world is different. After 70, 75 years of World War II, things are very different. So to me, having a political clout to counterbalance in some fashion the incumbent power base is very key. What advice would you give to your 18-year-old self to live both a happy and successful life, both professionally and personally? We generally create in the minds of young people a world of duality, either or. You can be a successful entrepreneur, but you may not be happy in your life. Or you can be happy, but you cannot be successful. You can plateau your own potential. 
I think that notion of duality principle, which is so ingrained in humans, one has to challenge that. One can say you can do both. You can be a great successful person, either as a career in a job or an entrepreneur, whatever you do, but you can be a very good family person, very good loving father or mother, whatever you are. I think that's very important. Most important element that I would recommend is that we all grow up with some biases. Our family is the socialization and it gives us biases for or against. Prejudice is negative, biases can be neutral. If I'm biased towards something, biased against something. Often we have to learn that in a globally integrated economy, we need to park our biases at the door and come with it more tolerant and more accepting or inclusive is a new buzzword we use, more inclusive attitude. So when you meet somebody else, you already have a stereotype in your mind. Based upon your information by age stereotype, by education stereotype, which institution did you graduate from stereotype, whatever they are. So we come with stereotypes because that's how we socialize ourselves from the family, from the faith, from school children, school, etc. So how do you see in others a potential? And how can you contribute to that potential? So an 18 year old can today contribute enormously to the other individuals, peer group leading, but can contribute to the community and the society. I find something very possible here in America, and I will give you an example in India the same way. In high school, last three years of high school, all students in America are asked to do a civic duty, something that you do in the community, which is above and beyond your classes, primarily, or the grades. And once they do that thing, they change themselves. Take a charity, etc. To me, that change happens by doing things to others who are less fortunate than you are, for example. Participating in volunteer works. Most top universities nowadays admit you not just on your grades or how well talented you are, but also have you done some civic duty. Now, there's a school named after me, Jagdish School of Management in Bangalore. The director is a very exciting individual, Atish Chattopadhyay. What he did was to create a curriculum where in the first term itself, typical PGDM, two-year MBA program, student teams go out and be in a very poor neighborhood, all term. Talk to the leaders of that community, identify the problem. What is it? Is it a water problem? Is it a sanitation problem? Is it an access to brands problem? Whatever turns out to be the case, they come out with a research project and recommendation, which is not as important as when they come back, they'll totally change themselves. They're never so poverty like that, even though they come from middle class. What is needed today for an 18 year old is empathy. The key dimension of leadership in the future in any old domain is not skill set, it's not even a passion, but empathy. Empathy means listening skills, identifying that there's somebody who is less fortunate than I am. I need to support, I need to be at least sympathetic, if nothing else, you know? So, the empathy is a very key dimension of leadership, arising more and more. More, more emotional side, you know, <laughs> as opposed to more rational side. And that, that bonds with people. The people see you more as a human being, not as a boss not as a worker, for example. I'm sorry I've given a long lecture like comment, but, but this is, I'm so passionate myself about this thing. No, thank you for answering that. And I think that's, that's a really important, um, I mean, everything you said is important, but especially the way you ended, right? That at the end of the day, no matter how much technology advances, ultimately you're dealing with people. And, and unless you have that ability, even when you were talking about what makes effective political leaders, this ability to connect with 
people from all sorts of backgrounds, right? It's not that everyone you meet is going to have the same economic, social um, background and history that you have. So I, I, I think I think those are all such valid and important points. And and it's important, you know, giving that example that it's important to have that in a sense intervention at a young age so people from a young age when they're developing understand what's important and how they should behave over a lifetime so thank no but so thank you so in fact for giving that i think it's a really valuable um lesson for anyone to learn at any stage in life um but professor i, I want to take this opportunity to thank you again for coming on it was absolutely wonderful listening to you and um, you know various experiences in your career and life and, and 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 I hope I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. No, I did. I'm sorry I could not come to your studio and do the interview in person. So we are using Zoom technology, but uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed. It. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. It, 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 I can understand. It would be a bit of a commute for you, so <laughs> I, I don't blame you for not making the trip. <laughs> but but thank you, Professor. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you.